Same. Yeah, same. I think the way that we start our days is so important. And, you know, I think it's in, not just not just for people to get up early because not everybody is a morning person. And I am a big believer in following your own circadian rhythm and, and really being aware and intentional about when does my brain most feel on? When does my body most feel movement or most need movement? When does my body most need rest? Yep. You know, I don't, I have a rule that I don't answer emails after it's dark outside because my brain just shuts off yep. at, 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 in the evening. Ironically, it's dark outside in the morning when I'm awake, when I wake up, but it's, I mean, in the evening, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I don't think there's a right formula. I just think there's a right formula for each person and figuring out what that looks like can be fun and, and involve a lot of experimentation, you know? I, I mean, it took me a while to actually figure out my my routine that works for me that doesn't... And I made a promise to myself seven years ago when I was in hospital. So this year mm-hmm. is actually seven years uh, when I was in hospital for my addictions and I mm-hmm. put myself in there because I didn't listen to anyone. And I made a mm. promise to myself and to God in that hospital bed at 3 a.m. in the morning that I would never, ever go back in the hospital because of my addictions ever again. Mm. And so, be, so began my philosophy of beating the sun. Mm. And so I, I've never missed a sunrise yet. doesn't matter if I'm sick, I'll still get up. Mm. It doesn't mean I'll exercise, but I will still get up. And I will still beat the sun. I will still do something for my mental health that keeps Mm -hmm. me away from ever going back to the hospital bed. (laughs) And what what was happening that brought you there? Was it, I mean, obviously it was caused by an addiction, but was it something that physically you couldn't ignore, mentally, all of the above? I think it was mo- most of the things that you mentioned and, and mm-hmm. a little bit more. So I have a, a tendency very much like what you actually talk about to be a perfectionist, to strive mm-hmm. for this ultimate level of being the best. And whatever that looks like for me, it's, and I'll, I'll probably kill myself in the process to get there. And mm-hmm. it, it so I got addicted to pornography when I was 12, mm-hmm. which then gave me some very, very unhealthy habits and fears and desires and basically destroyed my life um, mm. in a very nasty way. And then it also gave forth to some other addictions. So uh, when I tried getting away from pornography, I used exercise as a way of l- losing weight, which then wrecked my hormones but mm. hey, I thought, you know what? I, I don't have a desire to watch porn anymore. So let's keep going with this. Right. And because once again, I thought that I didn't have this desire anymore. But then I started noticing and started listening to people who were saying to me, Jay, you look great. So mm. I kept going with that. And the more I thought that I looked great, I was like, I need to be the best at this. Let's do it. Let's go. Right. But, I, I wasn't smart <laughs> at all. Well, I mean, I think I think you're human and as we all are and cross addiction is really common where you give up one thing and you take a behavioral change for, you know, an integrative holistic change when those two things are not the same. Yep. And I think, you know, and I, I talk about this a lot in the book and call those changes like they're, they're trash traits. You're just changing changing one brand of dysfunction for the other. And everybody does that. And, you know, until you become aware of the actual mechanics behind the addiction, because addiction is never, a you know, there's that old adage in therapy of it's never about what it's about. (laughs) And it's not about pornography or cocaine or exercise or external validation or whatever it is. It's always about connection. You know, and 
not just your connection to other people, but perhaps more so your connection to yourself and your own sense of self-worth and whether or not you believe that in this moment, no matter what you do or fail to do, you are as worthy of all the love, joy, freedom, connection, and dignity as as the quote unquote best human being or the best version of yourself, highest performing version of yourself could ever be. You know, these things are not prizes to be won at the end of some race, they're birthrights. And I think it's easy to forget this stuff. You know, I, if only I could just remember everything I know, <laughs> like, like my life would be a lot easier. And I think part of the, the, the process of writing this book was because I orbited this stuff for so long, not just professionally in my career, but also personally of, of like, knowing this, but not having the language to anchor it and not having the structure that a book can sometimes gift you to kind of contain it all in one spot as best a a book can do. And that's what I tried to do with the Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control. And, you know, as much as I hope that everybody who reads it connects with it. What I really did was write the book that I needed for myself. You know, I needed, I need ringing bells and I need reminders all the time, lest I just drift away. And not because, you know, I'm not smart or I'm not a good person or whatever, but just because I'm a human being. And that's what human beings do. You know, we complicate simplicity so much and life is very simple you know, be kind to people, share, drink water, eat fruits and vegetables, exercise, all the things. But like simple isn't always easy. And I think we confuse the two. Yeah. And I I really believe that when you get punitive as a response for conflating simplicity with ease, um, then only self-destructive and other destructive energies come from that. Like punishment, if people get nothing else from this book, I hope that they hear the message that punishment doesn't work in any circumstance. And not only does punishment not work, it is totally ineffectual, but it makes everything worse. And it, it breaks my heart to see so many people deploying punishment on themselves and others in the name of self-discipline and accountability and responsibility. It's so misguided and unnecessary and it's really causing so much pain. And like, my feeling is we're all in enough pain. Like we don't need to manufacture more pain for ourselves. And that's what punishment is. A punishment just lays pain on top of whatever's there. And punishment is really different and I spell this out in the Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, it's different than personal accountability. It's different than discipline. It's different than natural consequences. And it's different than rehabilitation. All of those things I just mentioned require thoughtful engagement. Punishment is lazy, requires nothing, and just is like this destructive tornado storm that ruins everything it touches. If you can't tell, I feel strongly about this. <laughs> no, I feel strong. I feel the same way uh, with you. And, and that's something that I did talk about in, in my book, maybe a very different way uh, to what you just described. But people are so good at beating themselves up. Like people are so good at seeing the negative all the time and, and hardly the positive because the positive is a lot harder to get to than, than the negative is. And they get stuck in this cycle right, of Mm -hmm. constantly thinking about this negative thing in their life and they don't want to stop it because it's comfortable. And once they've reached that level of comfortability, it's like misery loves comfort and they stay there and they don't want to move from that that place. Uh, And I know because I was very much like that and that's when you sort of start blaming yourself and start blaming others and you just get in this very very bad state of human existence which is not fair it's not right and i like what you said earlier it makes you human i mean Mm. it's it's okay and and the more i realize that it's okay to be human we all have these elements that 
a part and parcel of life, we have our choices where we can choose to, to stay stuck in, in this period of, of life, which is a very negative and horrible place to be. And I don't want to be in this place. I don't want to beat myself up all the time. What's the point? It feels terrible. Right. Well, I think the point for so many people is that they they don't know what else to do. Yeah. And it feels like when you don't know what else to do, punishment feels like the responsible thing to do. It feels like you're taking the moral high road. And that's why, I mean, at least in the United States, like that's why there is such a problem with just being emotionally illiterate. Like we don't teach this stuff in schools. How would you know? How would you know what else to do? And especially when punishment is a through line in your own culture, of course, you're going to integrate punishment as a default response to your own missteps. And so I think it's a really understandable thing and that people do want to change and do want to get unstuck and feel like if I if I squeeze this thing harder, then I'll make it work. And there's just such a forcefulness. And the alternative to punishment, which I don't even want to say alternative because that makes it sound like punishment is even an option in the first place when it's not. Um, but I guess the opposite of punishment is self-compassion. Yeah. And I loved talking about that in the book because it's a word or phrase that I hear like, rolling around culture like socks in the dryer when I just feel like we don't give it the weight and credence that it deserves. It's not just being super polite to yourself. Self-compassion is a resiliency building skill that involves three steps and you cannot progress without it. Like it's mandatory. And so it stuns me and shocks me. I sometimes feel like I have traveled back in time a hundred years. Like, how are we not talking about this in the very first opportunity we have to create like a public health curriculum in schools? How are we just omitting this entirely from the conversation? It, it's, it's so tragic. And I don't use that word lightly. It really is because it causes so much pain and suffering to think and operate as if punishment ever did anything for anyone. So I really dedicated a lot of the book, a whole chapter to spelling out like, hey, you don't know what self-compassion is. You and me both, we, everyone has to learn this stuff and here's what it is and here's what it's not. Just to give people an actual path to get out of their stuckness because punishment is not the way. It's never going to be the way and it's just going to bury you. What are those three steps to self-compassion? Well, so I used Dr. Kristen Neff's framework. She's a, a real pioneer in the field. She is to self-compassion what Dr. Brene Brown is to vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and she extracted her framework from um, Buddhist philosophy. And she says that self-compassion is about three things. One is common humanity, and that's understanding that however complex and protracted your problems feel and however alone you feel, your problems are actually common and ha are right the second occurring in millions of people, if not billions across the world. And, you know, the way I think about this is if nothing else happened right now in the midst of your very painful problem, then you were like picked up and plunked down in a room full of 50 other people who are all talking in detail about the same exact problem that they're having. And you don't have to do anything. You just sit there and listen. That in itself is curative because then you would realize and remember like, oh, I'm not alone. You know, when we say to people, you're not alone, I feel like that's often not really internalized. It's like, well, you could say that, but it, it's just sort of one of those, um, what's the word I'm thinking of that starts with a P? Platitude. Yeah. It's just, a, you know, and it just kind of makes people feel even more alone. But when you think about like a common humanity, your problems are common in the sense that they are experienced or have been before. And 
I think that that helps people to feel less alone, which is why storytelling is so important because you can hear through stories, movies, books, what that's like. Um, The second component is mindfulness. And mindfulness is another word that's like, what does that even mean? It's used in so many different contexts. And I think of mindfulness as being aware, and this is how Dr. Neff phrases it, you're aware of what you feel, but you're not over-identified with that feeling. And you're also not pretending that you don't feel it in the first place. And I would also add, let's say you feel disappointment, right? Not, Not an unfamiliar feeling for perfectionists. Mindfulness is not about saying something like, the disappointment does not matter. I am one with the whatever. Mindfulness is about saying, I feel so disappointed. This sucks. This is the worst. And then you say, what else do I also feel? And you turn your head a little bit and you see that you also feel relieved that maybe at least now you know something or you feel curious about what might be next for you or you feel grateful for this friend in your life who doesn't care about any of that stuff and just wants to hang out with you because they love you, or you feel sensual or playful or tired or whatever it is that disappointed isn't all you feel. And if you can be mindful about that, then the feeling has less power over you and it doesn't eclipse your entire emotional landscape. And I think that's what's scary about having uncomfortable feelings is like, There's so much resistance to them and there's so much lack of awareness that that's not all you feel that, you know, human beings, actually, it's very rare that we feel one thing at a time. This is the cheesiest thing that you have to forgive me for. And please, all your listeners, please forgive me for this. But um, someone explained it feelings to me in grad school like this, that feelings are like a triangle And what you're in touch with, let's say the disappointment is like the tip of the triangle. And there's always at least two other feelings attached to that. So there might be like disappointment, anger, and like sorrow. Another way to think about it is like disappointment is like the body of a bird. And the there are always like two wings, you know? And so that's a good question to enter into mindfulness with of like, what are the other two points of the triangle? Um... And then the third component of Neff's framework for self-compassion is kindness. And kindness is about really acknowledging that you are in pain. Like you're not just having a bad day. This isn't just hard. You know, sometimes when we describe what's going on, we tend to describe it in the external. Like, oh, I'm so busy and this is really hard and this is whatever. Instead of being like, this is painful, you know, I'm in pain and being able to really be gentle with yourself and just ask yourself like what the next thing you might need is, even if it's not like um, solutions oriented in a practical sense. So it's like, oh God, that, that must really hurt. Do you want some tea? You know, do you need to sit down for a second? Do you want to just like cancel this thing we were supposed to do and stay at home? And these are conversations you need to have with yourself, right? And so kindness is really about meeting your pain with some level of action. And whether the action is like being clear about saying a loving message to yourself or a kind message, or just like a compassionate response of like, let me help you like make this a little bit better you know, and saying that to yourself because other people often don't know. They don't know that we're in pain. And if you're a really high functioning person who's adept at keeping your pain invisible, not only do people not know that you're in pain, but they might be assuming that you're the opposite, that you're on top of the world, that you have, you know, one of the top podcasts as you do and nothing penetrates you and you have your morning and your workout and you figured all that out. So how could you possibly feel pain? And and people have no idea. Yeah. You only know what you know at the end of the day and you need a little bit more awareness. I think if you are, let's just say, cause I am a, a perfectionist mm-hmm. is it harder for a perfectionist to get to a, those three steps of understanding self-compassion properly in their life? You know, I don't think there's anything about, I'm a perfectionist also, and I frame perfectionism as 
a power in the book and a power that can be a really positive force in your life. And also, of course, a destructive force. And like any power, perfectionism has a dichotomous nature. So it can, you know, be a good thing or a bad thing, um, depending on how it's managed. And I think self-compassion is easier once you see that it works. Like, I think it's easier to enact once you get results. And that's hard for me to say because I feel like I should say something that's not attached to an outcome or results of like, you should do this for the sake of doing it. But the truth is that some of this stuff, and by stuff, I mean kind of being introspective, being thoughtful, being psychologically mind being psychologically minded can seem sort of um, amorphous and unstructured and kind of like, uh, okay, for what though? Like I, I live in the real world and I need to get things done. And so I don't have time to sit and like, you know, it's like a navel gazing kind of reaction for a lot of people. And I understand that because I have the same reaction too. But I think if you look at the research about how effective self-compassion is at moving people through stuckness and allowing them to actionably work towards whatever their goals are, whether they're interpersonal goals, professional goals, you know, personal goals, whatever it is, like self-compassion is like slamming your foot on the gas pedal as opposed to trying to get behind the car and push it which is what punishment is. It's like you, you, even if you move, like it's not comparable, you know? Do you use the triangle analogy when you're speaking with patients of yours? Then does it work? Um, I've talked about the triangle and, and little bird body analogy before. And I think people, yeah, I think of people in therapy as the healthiest people. Um, because I think the healthiest people are the ones who connect to support. And so it doesn't surprise me that it, you know, kind of works in terms of people being open to understanding a different strategy um, in therapy, because people that go to therapy are really open-minded about being strategic um, around their experience with life and what they want to feel and, and, how, who they want to be. Um, so yeah, I love that about therapy. I think it's a really adaptive way. I've noticed a lot of therapists and this is true for myself too, on a personal level. Um, it's that if you grew up around a lot of people who you couldn't help, who were not open or ready for receiving help, there's a feeling in you that's like, Oh, I want to do this so much. And and you maybe even enact it, but it's just futile. And anybody who loves someone who struggled with addiction knows this. Like the person, it doesn't matter how much you love them or how much you do or how informed you are, or how much you care. The person has to have an openness to a new way of thinking or relating to oneself or behaving. And therapy has been such an adaptive and natural path for me being a therapist because you're just surrounded all day by people who have that openness and readiness. It's actually a really healing, beautiful, impressive experience. And I'm always like, why isn't everybody a therapist? But then I understand why <laughs> other people may not, might not love it as much and have that same kind of um, experience with it. But yeah, there's a little bit of an alchemy happening in my work where I have always encountered people who are just so impressive, particularly when I worked in a rehab. I remember having this feeling of like, I don't, I haven't earned my place here. Like these people are like deeply wise and know what there is to know and just listening and being a fly on the wall when in, in a situation like that, when you're not necessarily actively participating, which is the therapists, it's a very odd role, right? Um, not that I have this approach of being a blank slate because I don't believe in that, but you're also... 
I don't think you do anyone a disservice by divulging every single detail about your life either. So it's a very measured kind of engagement. And wow, it's so powerful to be around people who are ready to be honest with themselves and who want more. You know, perfectionists are perfectionists because they want more. And I love that about perfectionists. I love the energy of perfectionists. I love asking them and listening to what do you want more of? What do you think that that thing will help make you feel or or help transform you into becoming? You know, it's just so deeply, endlessly interesting. As a therapist, how do you compartmentalize? Because I'm very much like you in that I want to help pretty much everyone, but you can't help everyone. So as a therapist, how do you compartmentalize being a perfectionist, wanting to help everyone, but you can't? How do you work that out? Yeah, well, I think you try to get around people who are open and willing and asking for help. And sometimes I've worked with people who are mandated to quote unquote treatment. I don't like that word because I prefer a model of healing as opposed to treatment and yeah, symptom management. To, to get treated. Yeah, it's not good. Right. And even in those moments, I find that people who are resistant are resistant for good reason. They have been misled or directly hurt by either the system that they're engaged in or their family of origin or some kind of, you know, trauma of disconnection. And I don't expect those people to receive me with open arms and they don't need to. I'm just there to offer a non-judgmental presence and I'm not trying to say, let me give you the list of how I can help you. To me, help is really just about connecting. And if someone wants to, you know, I talk about this in the book a little bit. I started I started my career in counseling, working with 15-year-olds who are mandated to treatment, 15-year-old girls. <laughs> like, there is no resistance that I, I have since worked with like, all every kind of population basically um who would seem to be much more intimidating and scarier and whatever but there is no level of resistance like a 15 year old girl who's just like fuck you who are you i don't care about anything you have to say and even those girls all of that stuff it's one inch deep we're all human beings. We all want to be seen. They're just protective mechanisms because this person has been hurt. And if they weren't, then I really believe that, that of course, someone would be open. You know, someone who's closed off is not closed off just because they feel like being morose and, um, and they're, you know, antisocial. They're closed off because of something and respecting that I think actually, and allowing that actually helps the person feel more trusting towards you. And it's important to try and and build trust. How long does it normally take when you see somebody new? How long does it normally take you to establish trust with that person so they can start opening up? Is it nor is it different for every person? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm sure you've. You experienced this in a micro way on your show where rapport is, it means something different to everyone. And the wonderful thing about therapy is, is there aren't very many rules to it other than like, you got to try to be as honest as possible. And I, I think people are smart and they can tell when, when you're a judgmental person or when you think that, when you think a big mistake that some times gets made in therapy is the therapist thinking that they're helpful because they know more. And that's not why you're helpful. You're not like smarter or more evolved or more conscientious or whatever. You may have more diagnostic training or understand the sort of like system in which we think about mental health and mental wellness and illness more. But the reason that you're helpful is because you, are, you offer an objective perspective and someone can tell you what's happening in their mind and in their life. And you are able to 
interpret that and synthesize that information back to that person minus all the assumptions and mental habits and insecurities that the person who's telling you immediately attaches to them. Mm -hmm. And so you can say, huh, it does sound like that's a possibility. Here's also another possibility. And you're not really offering advice as much as you're just broadening and putting some elasticity around the possibilities of what's unfolding within that person and around them. That's what a good therapist does. Yeah. Why did you want to be a therapist? Well, I mean, it's like, why would you not want to be, you know, I, I just think it's the best job. I mean, you get to be around people who are really invested in changing, curious about who they are you know, wanting to have meaningful connection and conversation and exploration. And I'm not like, I, I don't know. I don't, it's, it's easier for me to be in the therapy room sometimes than in my real life where I'm like at a cocktail party and people are talking about stuff I don't care about, like <laughs> the weather and this and that. And I'm just like thinking in my head the whole time. I wonder what this person is really experiencing right now. I wonder what they would talk about if they had a truth serum right now. Like, I just want to, I want to skip all the gateway conversation and the throat clearing conversation. And I just want to understand yeah, and connect. It, it's the core of the person. Yeah. And by the way, I don't always want to like hear everybody's traumas and, and dreams and deep stuff. Um, but Oh, you know, we spend a lot of time at our jobs and at work. And I want that time to feel meaningful and memorable. And, and I'm also helped by being a therapist because you learn so much from the people around you. And if you're a good therapist, like you are forced to grow because when you listen, you know, to me, the definition of listening is being open to changing your mind. And you can't listen and be open and not change and grow. It's impossible. And so your clients really push you mm -hmm. to do what they're doing every day, which is really showing up, you know, and it's great. I love it. Have you ever thought about becoming a therapist? Because <laughs> it's, it's a lot of the same yeah. skill set in the podcast, in this kind of like framework that you've got going. It's funny you should say that. I'm actually going to study to be a therapist in February. Oh, congratulations on that decision. Thank you. It took me a while to actually get to this decision in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I made it and I feel like it is the right thing for me to do because you're right. I mean the course of my life I've done many different things like I was in real estate I was working for after school care looking after kids and listening mm -hmm. to kids stories and their mental health problems I had one kid say that he was suicidal to me mm -hmm. um, I had so many other uh, so many stories I could tell you and then I also worked for disabled people at the same time mm -hmm. and learning about their health, their their lives. It was interesting for me. And then going into um, doing the podcasting and then just asking questions. And I th I think my favorite my favorite people to actually have on the show have always been therapists. I've always mm -hmm. been psychologists, people that just help other people. And I think I, I just relate to you guys a lot more. I love what you do. I have a high respect for it because in my own life, therapy has been a huge help. And I, my same, purpose, same. wanting to help others, you know, the same, same instance. So I'm glad you asked. And this is like why I'm asking you all these, these questions, because I want to learn uh, as much as I can before going in, because you've got a lot more experience than what I do. So I've always been... I'm curious, like, because I get different responses from different therapists on how it actually is, because the person themselves is different. But I think right. I I connect with you a lot because it's like we're we're, we're similar in many many ways. Mm -hmm. So 
I love that. <laughs> yeah. You, well, uh, a great book, a great book to get. Um, I know I'm supposed to be talking about my own book, but also another great book is Dr. Irvin Yalom, who's in his nineties now. He, he's has like, I don't know, 14 books or something like that. And he, a lot of his books were academic for a long time. He created a lot of principles around group therapy, but I think you will really love this book called, I have it right here. The gift of therapy looks like Ah, yes, an open letter to a new generation of therapists and their patients. And each chapter is like two pages or three pages. And there's like 40 some chapters in there. And it's just revelatory. I, this is my copy from grad school and I lent it to someone once and I was like, Oh my God, the intimacy of what I just did. It was actually a client. And I was like, I went to supervision, which is like therapy for therapists about the dynamics unfolding with their clients. And I was like, I just, I'm not sure about a decision I made to give to, to lend my Yalom book because it felt like such an intimate exchange. It almost felt wrong. And I was like, oh my God, my, ther- oh my, my God. supervisor was like laughing hysterically at me. And she's like, you're fine. Like relax. <laughs> um, but yeah, that book is great. And I actually use one of Yalom's chapters in that book. In my book, I highlight his work because it's been so influential to me, um, which is strike when the iron is cold. And so this is something that he talks about it in a clinical perspective of like, if you are working with someone who has a tendency to take a victimhood stance, wait until they're taking a more empowered stance and then point out that they have a tendency to take a, a stance of victimhood because then the issue isn't so hot and, um, delicate And I just think it's the best strategy to apply to any situation of, you know, when you're having a conflict with someone you love, waiting until you're in a really great connected space with them that just feels secure and safe to say, you know, something I've been thinking about lately is X, Y, and Z, and I really like to talk about it. Um, In parenting, in, in work situations, you know, there's just so many applicable contexts. And I put... um two chapters in the book that were, that are just really practical, right? So it's like different, 10 different perspective shifts that just allow you to stop controlling, trying to control your thoughts one by one and instead engage the power of an entirely new perspective, which is such the better way because then it automates your thoughts in, Mm. in, you know, um, in a reframed way. And the other chapter is about eight things that you can actually do tools that you can use. And one of those tools is Yalom's strike when the iron is cold. I love it. I love it too. I'm just um, opening up your book because I I do want to talk more about your book because I think it's brilliant. And thank you for those people that are wondering what kind of perfectionists they actually are. So I think it's a good segue into this. So thank you for, helping me go into it. (laughs) Mm. Um, But you've got five types of perfectionists, I believe, that you talk about. you got the classic, you got the messy, you got the intense, the partisan, and the procrastinator. Procrastinator. Um, Right. And um, you got a quiz in the very beginning of the book, which I think is very, very useful. You ask, you lay out a bunch of things. And, yeah, and who doesn't love a pop psychology quiz? I mean, oh, I love them. I'm a, um, don't you love them? Is there a better way to spend six minutes of your life? It's like, <laughs> no, this sweet. quiz is actually like two minutes. I know. It makes sense. <laughs> that, that's me. Like, uh, I'm just looking at it at the moment. And yeah, uh, I'm the classic. I think yeah. you, probably could have already, oh, wow. you probably could have already uh, uh, seen that about me from, from the conversation. <laughs> Love a classic perfectionist. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, um, let's, let's go into the five types yeah. and how we can tell whether or not one person is that type of progress, uh, perfectionist, let's say. Right. Right. Well, perfectionism is like I said at the top of the conversation is such a kaleidoscopic construct that we've been really, approaching in the wrong way, in a really reductive way. And 
Perfectionism is expressed. It's a context dependent thing. So I am going to talk about all of these types, but I also want people to hear that you can be one type in your dating life and a whole other type in your work life. And so there's a fluidity to it as there is to any identity structure. All identity structures operate on a continuum and some of them are, are highly context dependent. And there are good things and bad things, quote unquote, about each of these types, meaning they all have their strengths and weaknesses for the same point that like perfectionism isn't good or bad. It's a power and yeah. it's not, it's about man. All power needs to be managed conscientiously in order to be useful. Um, so we have the classic perfectionist, which, you know, on the pros side, these are people who are very disciplined. They're, they add structure to anywhere they go. Um, they do what they, what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it in the way that they said that they would do it. Right. So they're very reliable and predictable on the con side. They can kind of over index sometimes on what they're supposed to do in a way that misses the point, um, in terms of feeling connected to what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so sometimes they can feel interpersonally like, some of their relationships are transactional or that they're underappreciated for all that they do because, you know, they're just the ones who will always do it. Right. So you, you don't have to think about it. Um, and then there is the intense perfectionist. And these are people who on the pros side, really razor sharp focus when it comes to achieving an outcome. And they don't mess around. They are amazing at being efficient and they're going to get it done. The problem can sometimes arise when they, they focus on the outcome at the expense of their own health and wellness or the health and wellness of those around them. So, yep. you know, the public personas of like Steve Jobs or Gordon Ramsay, I don't know these I didn't know those two people, but from what was presented in the public, they would fit the profile of an intense perfectionist, right? Um, and some intense perfectionists, like when intense perfectionists manage their perfectionism, all the stuff that was sort of like swirling around chaotically before, like all comes together to create this high gravitas, like magnetic leader, kind of energy. And it's a really a sight to behold. I love working with intense perfectionists so much. Um, then there's the Parisian perfectionists, which in simplistic terms, you can say they want to be perfectly liked. It's also though about wanting to perfectly like others, because on a deeper level, this type of perfectionism longs for an ideal connection. So we want to be perfectly connected to ourselves, to our God or higher power, to our you know, kids to our employees to whomever. And it's wonderful to be a Parisian perfectionist because these types of people have a natural live wire understanding of the power of connection. They're naturally warm and inclusive and all that good stuff. But of course, on the con side, Parisian perfectionists um, can go into overdrive when it comes to people pleasing. And they can take shortcuts in their desire for connection, which aren't authentic and actually leave them feeling disconnected, not just from the person that they're trying to connect to, but perhaps more importantly, from themselves. Yeah. Then there's the messy perfectionist. And that perfectionist wants the middle of the process to be perfect. Um, they are start happy they can start anything like messy perfectionists have a million ideas. They're superstar idea, idea generators. They can just begin and push through the anxiety of a new beginning effortlessly. Like it's, a, it's incredible. Um, the problem is when they hit the inevitable tedium of the middle, when you have to do things like, you know, pay taxes, <laughs> file for, make spreadsheets and, you know, do all that boring stuff. Um, it's kind of like, Ugh. And, you know, 
to go back to our context dependent thing, this is like how much of a rush it feels when you're dating someone new. You're like, this person's amazing and incredible. And then you start to see that they are still amazing and incredible, but there's something that you weren't expecting or that maybe throws you for a loop. And it's like, oh, I'm out. I'm done. I can't do this. You know? And so that's what happens when that kind of perfectionism isn't managed. You like say yes to a million things without committing to even one thing. Mm. And that's that can be actually really dangerous because what I see a lot is messy perfectionists who then internalize that as like, something must be wrong with me. Nobody takes me seriously. I can never follow through on anything. None of that is true. That's all in your head. It's just that, you know, you need boundaries and tools around your enthusiasm in order to funnel it into like an, an, a long enduring outcome. And the counterpart to messy perfectionists are procrastinator perfectionists who want the conditions to be perfect before they start. So procrastinator perfectionists, unlike messy perfectionists, have a ton of anxiety around the beginning. And on the prose side, they are such good preparers. They have a 360 angle on so many different scenarios that could happen. They're not impulsive people. They're thoughtful, you know, um, but of course their preparative efforts can sometimes be protracted to the point of past diminishing returns. Um, and they just can't get something off the ground in a way that's really frustrating to them because they want to do this. They know it, they know how to, but, um, they just can't like pull the trigger, you know? Um, and then which other one did I not say? Did I, I say them all? I think oh, you per- mentioned them all. Yeah, no, I got them all. Yeah. You got them all. So would it be, cause as you were describing all five to me, I think there was an element of all five within me, but I lean more towards the classic. Is that true for most people that they have a bit of everything? Yes. I think one is typically dominant, but there are pieces of each one in all of us. And just like, I think there's a, there's a perfectionist in everyone, Mm -hmm. but calling yourself a perfectionist is about, is there a patterned, and you know, my definition of perfectionist is someone who notices the difference between the reality plunked down in our laps and this ideal over here. You know, it's a very unique trait to our species that we have the cognitive capacity to understand and interpret everything that's happening, but also imagine this second reality or perhaps infinite other realities that could also be happening. And perfectionists are people who notice that gap And in response to the gap, feel a compulsion to try to actively bridge the gap. And when you're on the healthy side in an adaptive space, as it's called in the research world, you understand that ideals are meant to inspire. They're not meant to be achieved. That's the purpose of an ideal. And when you're on the maladaptive side, you think that the ideal is the goal. And, you know, of course that ends up being very destructive. How did you discover all these five and how did you start thinking about the fact that, okay, being perfectionist can be your superpower. It's not, it's -hmm. not all bad. Yeah. Well, I think I noticed patterns in my work and I noticed, you know, I talk about this for a quick second in the book. I was just on this path where I had moved to New York to pursue my dream, which was to become a therapist and have my own practice and, you know, live in New York City and all that stuff. And I did it all and I got married and my husband and I were like, in the first year of our marriage, after one year, then we'll try to have kids. And we got pregnant and I was getting routine blood work back from that pregnancy and um, realized that I was very sick and I needed to go into treatment immediately, go into, um, chemotherapy. I lost that pregnancy and my life just spun out of control. And this like very perfectly constructed situation 
was just like crumbled. And this was happening alongside so many things in my professional career that were just about to take off. I mean, it was the equivalent of being like a week away from publication day on your book. And it's like, oh, I can't do any of that stuff anymore because my world became very narrow and very small. And it was going to chemo for six hours a day and then working. And I remember thinking like, oh God, like, I hope I don't ever have to give up my practice. I'm going to try to do this until I don't because it gave me so much energy to be at work and not being at work didn't give me energy. And of course I was sick. So of course people were telling me like, slow down, be balanced, you know, do nothing. And that was something I tried to do for a while. And it really hurt me because I remember, you know, the way I describe it in the book is like, I remember sitting in my bathtub with this like pink bath bomb. You know what those are? I don't know if you take baths, but right. the, <laughs> yeah. and this, I plopped this pink bath bomb into my bath and I was just listening to it fizz and watching it fizz away, just bored out of my mind. Just like, this isn't restorative for me. I don't want to be sitting in this tub. I, I mean, I love a good bath, but in, in a... In a really frustrated way, I was I was like, this isn't what's healthy. I know what's healthy for me. And I realized how much I was listening to outside voices telling me what I needed and what was healthy and what was right. And telling me to quote unquote, find balance, which is this directive that is hurled at women. And to me, balance doesn't exist, you know? I don't know one balanced woman. I know a lot of people who feel like they're almost balanced or they'll be balanced after the holidays or as soon as this very important and serious situation is handled or they'll be balanced, you know, on Saturday morning when their crazy work week is done and, and et cetera, et cetera. And it continues to elude us because it's not real. And so, you know, all this stuff started to come together and I realized that I was a perfectionist. And then I thought, if I can be a perfectionist and I don't ever know where my phone is and like anybody could be a perfectionist, you know? And I, it just broke the mold of so many things, preconceived notions I held that were untrue. And then I really dove into the research and I was surprised to see that research on perfectionism is actually in its infancy. And we don't really know a lot about this construct. There's no clinical definition for any of this stuff. Um, there is for rigid perfectionism, which is like presents in mental disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder, for example. But I, I'm not talking about that type of perfectionism in this current conversation, though I do discuss it in the book. There's, there, it's like the wild, wild west with this stuff. And so I was like, well, since I'm not able to find any words or language for what I'm noticing and what I'm feeling, I am going to try to put to words what I'm seeing and the patterns that are present to me in the years that I've spent doing clinical work and, you know, being introspective myself. How is your health now? My health is great. And I mean, that was a highly treatable, I think the the treatment rate's like 95%. So I never felt like I'm going to die. Um, I never felt like it wasn't going to be okay. But it did feel like a real loss of control. And I mean, I I think at the time, thank you for asking, by the way. Um, at the time, they were like, okay, we'll just do, I had some incredible doctors and they were like, we just need to do this one thing. And, and, you know, in one to 2% of patients, X, Y, and Z happens. And you always hear that when you're going through a medical procedure or, or medical treatment and you're like, okay, well, I could never be the one or 2%. And I kept being the one or 2%. So it was like, I felt assured on one level, but then I was like, oh, this is the part in life where I learned that actual human beings are the one or 2% that all the bad stuff happens to. And I'm in that group right now. And so it was a really weird paradox to be in. Was but, it, what sort of diagnosis was it? If you're comfortable with sharing it, it was it something a, called gestational trophoblastic disease. 
Oh, wow. Or like the cells of your pregnancy metastasize essentially into the uterine wall and like begin to mimic a cancer. And so if you don't catch it quickly, then it does become, I mean, it is technically a cancer, um, but it's highly treatable. So it took me a long time to even call it cancer because I was like, this doesn't feel right calling it a cancer when some people are at like stage four pancreatic cancer. That's a very different experience, obviously. But then when I think back on how much time was lost sitting in Memorial Sloan Kettering, the hospital here in New York, just sitting in treatment and, you know, losing a lot of my hair, losing a lot of my eggs without having the ability to freeze them again and ultimately having to have a hysterectomy. Like it was a lot. It was a toll, you know? Um, so I'm grateful to be healthy. And at the same time, I also want to acknowledge that that, that was really hard. It took me a long time to do the latter because I just felt like lucky, like, oh, at least it's not this and at least it's not that. And I was kind of like minimizing how, much it was to just put your body through that, you know. Did you end up having a child before the hysterectomy? Yeah. Um, what ended up happening is that I ended up doing five rounds of IVF. Um, I have not really ever talked about this publicly, but I'm happy to share with you. Thank you. Um, Don't mean yeah. to pry too much into you. No, 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 no. I like it. I, you know, you know, I'm not one for small talk. We've established <laughs> that, right? <Maybe> that. <laughs> um, I did five rounds of IVF and one of them, and it was not going well. And one of them was so bad that I remember the doctor being like, we're not even going to try to do an egg retrieval. We're just going to cancel this round. But thankfully in the last round, um, I don't know what happened, but you know, it was really successful. And so I couldn't do an embryo implantation then because you have to wait a year of being in remission before you can get pregnant again, because they want to make sure the cancer's gone. Because obviously you can't do things like chemotherapy and be pregnant at the same time. Yeah. And so I waited a year and, um, did the embryo plant implantation and it was successful and I have a daughter. And then after that, after I gave birth to her, I continued to have a lot of health complications that I was trying to correct through like surgeries and things like that. And ultimately my doctors were recommended a hysterectomy and, and it's a different feeling when you have a kid and you're like, I can't, I gotta be here you know? Um, and so that's what I did. And I'm so happy that it ended up that way. My, my, I, I'm one of four kids. So I always thought that I would have a lot of kids, but this is very much a perfectionist guide to losing control moment because it's like, if I could have controlled it, I just would have had so many kids, you know, but at the same time, like my family feels very complete with this little girl in my life and she's incredible and she's so funny. And like, I'm, I'm my book launches next week. Right. So I'm doing all my book packages and I, I get up really early in the morning and, and I'm working and, and she often finds me and has found me through the, through, this is a many years long process. I don't know how, how long the path of an eagle took for you to write, but. Four years. Four years. Right. So, I mean, book writing is no joke. So she would always <laughs> find me in my, in my home office writing. What are you doing, mommy? Mommy's writing a book. And <laughs> so she came into the living room where I have like stacks of, of the boxes and the tissue and the little goodies that are all in the book promotional packaging. And she was like, mommy, I'm going to help you with this. What do you need help with? And so I gave her like a little bit of a fake job that you might give a little kid where I'm like, oh, I really need those, these chocolate bars in rows of five. Cause I know she can count. And so she's putting them in rows of five. And I said, thank you so much for helping me. This is really generous of you. And she said, well, you've been doing it for years. So I know it's important. And like, just this funny stuff that she says all the time that I, I don't know. I'm just like, thank God you're here. You know, I think about 
how often we, the, you know, to bring this back to the book, there's um, something called counterfactual thinking where we have an experience and then we immediately, it's a reflex of our minds. So everybody does it. We have an experience and then we immediately have a counterfactual thought, which is like the fact is in front of us. For example, the fact is I got in a fender bender car accident, not a serious car accident. And then the counterfact might be, I could have been in a serious accident, you know, and whether your counterfactual thought is an upward counterfactual or downward counterfactual impacts your mood. And I'm very lucky that with Abby and the whole IVF situation, I had a natural like downward counterfactual thought, which is when you think about not just the reality and like how, oh, but I could have had, she's so great, but I could have had more kids, but she's so great. And I could have had no kids. You know, I think when you go through what I went through, that's the natural counterfactual thought is like, wow, I could have not been okay. And I could have not had any successful retrievals and all of that kind of stuff. And and if you are not aware of the way, the direction your counterfactual thinking is operating around, it's like driving on the wrong side of the road mm. in your mind. And you're just going to crash because I don't think as a default, we necessarily choose the healthier thing. Mm. You know, I feel like in a weird way, I got lucky having to go through so much just to get pregnant because I realized how in a different time, if I was born 30 years before the technology that's available now, like no way would I ever be a mom, you know, or perhaps alive. It's, it's wild. So that's another one of the tools is learning how to understand what your counterfactuals are and how to make them healthy. Um, Additive counterfactuals, for example, like adding solutions to your counterfactual thoughts as opposed to subtractive, which are unhealthy, which is like, let's say you are in a meeting and you say something in the meeting and then you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that thing in the meeting. That was such a dumb thing to say. And you immediately go into this punitive dialogue in your mind. That's your counterfactual thought of like, I could have not said that. And I wish I didn't say that. And an additive an additive thought next would be like, well, maybe next meeting I can go with the prepared question or maybe next meeting I can think about my question and then email it the next day to the team if it feels like a useful thing to ask. Whereas a subtractive counterfactual, only, you only subtract a behavior. There's only one solution, which is to not do that thing. And that's a really negative space to be in because it's not a solutions-oriented space and it doesn't have multiple solutions to choose from. So it doesn't feel empowering. A subtractive counterfactual thought is like, I'm never going to talk in meetings again. And once you have the language for this stuff, it's just so much easier to navigate around it and understand, oh, right now I'm I'm engaging in counterfactual thinking and it's subtractive. I'm now I'm going to make it additive. And it's, you know, maybe not that much like one, two, three, ding, but it's possible. Thank you, first and foremost, for sharing that side of your life. I know it's never easy to do it publicly or share it with a complete stranger uh, like myself and then everyone that is listening. But I, I am so much more appreciative and grateful that you did share it. Uh, your your little girl is a little miracle. And, she uh, is. I know it. Yeah. Every day I know it. Everyone kind of reminds me of my mom in many ways, like all three like myself and my two brothers were all miracles. And even the one that she ended up losing before having me, a uh, miracle as well, because the doctors all told her that she wouldn't be able to have kids ever. Mm. And so she mm -hmm. she was able to have, uh, we'll say she got pregnant with, with four, but ended up losing one. Um, mm -hmm. But in saying that, if that one had been born, I probably wouldn't be here today. So it all... It all worked out in the end, as if you can say that. Um, don't want to be. Yeah, I mean, I think life is a beautiful mystery. We never really know why or how things unfold the way that they do. Um, but I, I think it's a real show of 
honor and gratitude to just like find some joy yeah. in in whatever did unfold um, that you are happy about in your life. You know, there, there's always more stuff you can do. There's always more things to want. And if you're an ambitious person, you're always going to see so much more ahead of you than behind you. That's what makes you ambitious, you know? And so really being able to take the time and be intentional about loving what is already there is such a powerful um, gesture. And it kind of reminds me of, you have this quote in the book, in the very beginning, she is what she is and she is whole. So loving the fact that you are a whole person, no matter what. Yes. Yes. That quote is from Dr. Clarissa Pincola Estes, who wrote Women Who Run With the Wolves. And yeah, I think the the main discovery that I found in this work and writing this book is that perfectionists are not seeking flawlessness. They're seeking wholeness. And if you break down the word perfection, you know, per from the Latin root means completely and facere means done. And so perfacer is the Latin root of, of the word perfection. And when we describe something as perfect, you just described yourself as a, you know, complete stranger. We, you know, we use the word perfect and complete interchangeably and say, so, oh, this person is a perfect stranger to me because that's really what the word means. And when you realize that what you're after isn't flawlessness, it's a sense of wholeness and that actually that wholeness is coming from inside of you. It changes everything about the way you see yourself, the way that you see, you know, what you're supposed to be doing, the way that you think about things. It's just such a more powerful way to, you know, for me, move through the world. So this has been so wonderful to have such a nice long runway to talk about this. And I could talk about it for so long. I mean, I feel like I put this at the end of the book, like there's so many things that I wanted to bring up that didn't seem to fit anywhere. And my editor was like, oh, just put it in the author's note. And so I, at the end of writing it, I turned in this author's note that was like, I don't know, something like 40 pages or something, not book pages, but 40 like word document pages. And she was like, you know, so kind. She's so wonderful. And also like, did not know what to do with it. So I was like, I'm just going to publish it on my, on my blog. So, you know, this book is a conversation starter and I really hope people have this conversation with me through the book. Um, I tried my best to put, I don't think books and therapy are the same at all, but I tried my best to put like two years of therapy into a book. I challenged myself with that. And I think this is as close to doing that as you can get. I know that uh, it's getting late for you at the moment and I feel um, me trying to end this conversation is going to be a little bit hard because I'm really, really enjoying speaking to you. But uh, nonetheless, I do want to be full of you. Uh, so wrapping this up in a nice way, where do you want people to get a copy of the book? At the time we're recording this, the book is coming out next week, which is pretty exciting. You must be nervous, jazz, the whole thing. Uh, where do you I want feel them? great. Yeah. Um, so the book is The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control, A Path to Peace and Power. And it's sold all over the world. Um, so get it wherever you buy books. <laughs> And you can find me, I'm on Instagram at Catherine Morgan Schaffler. And my website is also my name, CatherineMorganSchaffler.com. So come find me, join the conversation, hang out, get the book, let me know what you think. I really hope people connect with it because I think connection is the greatest currency we can offer each other as human beings and I've connected to so many books that I've just like held close to me. And, you know, that's, I think everybody's dream for their, their books is to have someone just feel like, Oh, this, this fits this moment in my life, you know? Well, I think you are a wonderful human being and I cannot wait to go into my local bookstore and see it on display. And then, um, 
purchase a couple of copies to help support you because I know how important that actually is. I got the uncorrected proof, so I know I'm, I can't wait for the actual real one. Um, yeah, I have the real one here. It's like oh, it came yeah. in a few weeks ago. We, I mean, I guess it looks pretty much the same, but it's it's like the thud of a book. My friend was talking to me about this today, like something so comforting about the thud of a of a hardcover book. Tell me about it. It it just something about it. It just feels so good. <laughs> like, I know. Aren't books magical? I love it. And when it's this complete, was so nice, even better. But um, yeah, oh, yeah. When it's done, and all the the copy editors, by the way, we need to have a side conversation about how angelic and ma- miraculous they are. Everyone was like, "You're gonna hate the copy editing; it's so tedious." And I had the complete opposite reaction. I was like, "Excuse me, multiple people are gonna pour their perfectionistic tendencies over this and make sure that I didn't misplace a single comma. Like, where can I?" roll out the red carpet for these mysterious people that I've never met in real life, but who just made the book sing. I'm so grateful to proofreaders and copy editors and and the whole team that created this book. I mean, publishing is such an amazing space in a way that I never appreciated or understood. And I got so lucky with my publishing team at Portfolio. They, I can't believe you just turn in a Word document and they make it into a whole book. It's amazing, right? The whole process. I, I agree with you. I like saying that uh, I'm Batman and grandma's the Joker. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I suck at grammar all the time. Yeah. Great for yeah. the fact that people can actually come alongside and help me out. <laughs> heroes, yeah. unsung heroes. Yeah, they really are. But Catherine, thank you so much for your time today, your wisdom, your it's advice. It's been such a pleasure. I hope we can connect again. I would love to come back on and talk more because I really, really loved this conversation. You're more than welcome back anytime. Just, yeah, and we're going to continue the conversation off, off air anyway. So, but yeah, thank you so much for joining me on the Storybox. Thank you for having me. 